<laughs> so just by way of introduction, I feel like this uh, this tour is a year late in coming because certainly uh, Hannah Boyden was speaking to me about it a year ago and we were planning on going, but then things uh, moved faster than anyone could have possibly expected. And to be fair, you know, on a personal level, I must say I'm incredibly frustrated. Let's put it that way, because I don't just like being cooped up in a shawl or in a classroom or on a Zoom. I want to get out there and get, as we call it in a bit, bashetach. There is so much to learn and see and do and experience, <coughs> both around, uh, around London, around the UK, and absolutely and clearly further afield as well in Europe and even possibly beyond, where we can deepen our understanding of our identity, our heritage, shed some light on different portions, aspects, concepts in the Torah as well. But um, being that we've basically all been grounded for the best part of a year, we have to make do with what we've got. And fortunately for us, when it comes to the British Museum, they've done a fantastic job using Google Street View to do Google Street View. You can kind of drive your driverless Google car all the way around the museum itself. They've done really an excellent job. So we're going to take advantage of that. But on the other hand, I am somewhat reluctant to share everything because you cannot compare. You cannot compare watching it on the screen to being able to touch it in a museum. You can't it compare seeing things in a museum to actually seeing them in situ. And when you go and see things, as I said, Bashetach, in the field, and you are totally immersed in the experience, it's a totally different learning experience. In fact, uh, the Pasuk says, vanim shimuli yiras Hashem al we say it on Shabbos morning, or we used to uh, back in the olden days when we said Pesukim Zimra. Hopefully, we still do. Lechuvanim shimuli yeras Hashem alamedchem, which means, um, "Go, my son." Can, I, can people hear me? By the way, just uh, people hear me. Okay, okay. We've got lots of thumbs up. Okay, so for the person that didn't, you might need to see if you could turn, need to turn up your volume. And um, lechuvanim shimuli yiras Hashem alamedchem means go my sons and listen to me, I'll teach you fear of Hashem. Now, if I was David HaMelech writing that Pasuk, I wouldn't have written it that way. L'chuvanim shimuli. No. Ba'ubanim shimuli. Come, come and listen. Right, Tashma, come and listen. But on Seder night, we say, say ulmad. Say, go and learn. L'chuvanim. Go, my sons, shimuli, and listen to me. You ask Hashem alamedchem. Why? Because sometimes you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to be able to learn. To get up off the armchair, off the chair, <laughs> off the bench, out of the, out of the pew, in order in yeah. order to be able in order to be able to learn. Because that's how we learn best when we are uh, when things are different, when the experiences are um, are varied, and we're having a multi sensory experience. We can immerse ourselves in the pictures that we see. So here we go. In the time that we have, let's uh, go for a little trip, get on the train, get an Uber, however you fancy traveling, it's fine. It's all free. Um, and travel down to Bloomsbury to uh, the British Museum. So uh, there will be a number of screen shares. You just have to bear with me when I get the right ones, OK? Um, sorry, apologies. Okay. Okay, so we are now just in the big entrance hall, which is really quite remarkable of the British Museum. This was originally outside. You can see this incredible innovative roof that they put on here. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. So where are we? The British Museum is, um, I, I, I like to call it the site of the largest number of stolen goods in the country. No question about it. These are things that were pillaged, pilfered, borrowed um, on, on, a, on, on um, what's it called, unlimited loan, indefinite loan from all our various different colonies in the time when the sun did not set on the British Empire and everything that was pink belonged to, uh, belonged to Great Britain. Unfortunately, the empire, uh, there isn't much to talk about, but certainly a lot of the relics are still in Bloomsbury, safely ensconced under lock and key and things like the Elgin marbles, for example, although the Greeks might want them back, it doesn't look like they're going back anytime soon. So what you have here, this is actually the permanent collection, about 8 million different things, okay? It's possibly one of the finest museums in existence. 
um, because the British had almost unlimited power. Um, and so some of the things that they took were just absolutely remarkable. And the story of the British Museum, the story that it seeks to tell, is not just British culture. It's a story of human culture from the beginnings to the present time. And it actually was the first public national museum in the world. So when we go through the British Museum, you could spend, without, without, without a shadow of that, you could spend days traipsing around, just looking and peeking and peering and, and, and experiencing incredible artifacts. It's, it's remarkable. I know when, when I went there um, for the first time in recent years anyway, my mission was to try and figure out how to tell the Jewish story in the British Museum and how to do it as succinctly as possible. We're only going to see one small part of it today, um, but it is very much the idea of our story rather than the story of the Aztecs, the Toltans, the Mayans. There's lots of, uh, lots of different stories there, but we're going to see our story. But more than that, we're just going to focus now because it's Arab Pesach, we're going to focus on Egypt. And just another thing which is very important, as we stand here and we look around this, uh, this remarkable building before we go into room four, is the, um, we say in the Haggadah, Every person has to see themselves as if they've left Egypt. And there's no question about it also, that being able to visualize Egypt, to understand that it's a real place, it's not just the stuff of fairy tales. It was a real culture. It was a real world superpower. It really, it's a, it's a very real place with a massive impact on the modern world as well. So the more that we understand that physically, that we were slaves, that's absolutely crucial on Seder night. However, and this is my word of caution, um, although we'll touch on some academic points, the point here is not to have an academic experience in the British Museum this evening, rather to shed light, color, dimension to our Seder experience that uh, will be done this time next week, but certainly what we have uh, on Matzah Shabbos and Sunday, to add a little more of the experiential element to it, we can't go and see the pyramids uh, this year, but at least to be able to have that But the purpose is not just to remember the history. That's not why we have Seder night. The reason why we have Seder night is far more to understand the implications of being taken out of Mitzrayim. Achshav kervanu hamakam lavodasa. In the beginning, our forefathers were idol worshippers. And it's a dispute. Is it talking about Avram Avinu's father or was it talking about our ancestors in Egypt? Two different ways of understanding it. But the bottom line is that we're here for a reason, we're here for a purpose. So immersing ourselves for a little while in Mitzrayim is useful, not just for the academic aspects of how that's so fascinating, but more to see ourselves <coughs> excuse me, as being part of that story. In fact, the, uh, the famed Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, the Pietzetzner Rebbe, who's a remarkable, incredible individual, a master educator who was killed in, a, in the Ernstfest, which was the harvest, the so-called Nazi Harvest Festival, 1943, November 1943, in a place called Travniki, um, not a million miles away from Majdanek. So the, um, the Pietzetzner Rebbe, who we'll, we will have to learn about, in much more detail, writes in one of his books that when you learn Tanakh, and I might have mentioned this before, you have to see yourself as being part of that story. You have to see yourself as being part of the experience of the Jewish people. So you're there in Mitzrayim. You're there when we leave. You're there eating the man. You're there at the Egel Azab. You're, you're there. You're seeing it. You're visualizing it. You're experiencing it. Because then it's so much more real and the lessons are so much more powerful. So we're going to go into the first room we're going to visit now is room four. So uh, just for the sake of brevity and time, we'll close this one. And here we go. This is room four in the British Museum. Okay, can you see, just to check, can you see the Rosetta Stone in front of you? Yeah? Okay, fantastic. So this Rosetta Stone, this is another one of these highly controversial artifacts that the Egyptians would love to have back, but they ain't getting it. Um, what is it and why is it so important? This it just gives us an introduction into Egyptian culture for many, many years. The study of hieroglyphics was a closed book to the Western world. It was a lost tradition. There was no one in Egypt that was able to translate hieroglyphics. It was something that was lost over time. 
And we knew that, and academics knew the Egyptians wrote and communicated in the hieroglyphics, and clearly the, um, the, um, the images are much more pictorial than the classic alphabets that we all use, whether it's the Western alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, the Afdal. Um, it was a whole different skill set. It was a whole different way of communicating, but there was no way of translating it. So there were educated guesses, but people thought it was just pictures with nothing more than that. Actually, what happens when they discover the Rosetta Stone, and the Rosetta Stone does not date back to Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim. This is a, dates back to the Greek period where people were still speaking ancient Egyptian languages. Um, it was possibly displayed in a temple. Um, eventually though, it is moved to a place called Rashid, which is Rosetta in the Nile Delta. And it was discovered in 1799, and it is a remarkable discovery. Um, the, who, who discovered it? A French officer. The French are very dominant in the area at that time. A guy called Pierre Bouchard during Napoleon's campaign to Egypt. And what happens is that this is the first text, which is bilingual, it's actually trilingual, um, Egyptian text to be discovered in modern times. And basically they are able to um, decipher, because it has a direct translation into Greek on it, which obviously people do know, people, they were able to decipher eventually how hieroglyphics works. So it really, um, it took time. Um, there were, later on, they actually do find things that are more trilingual, and therefore, the Rosetta Stone is no longer unique as a historical resource, because we do have others. However, because it was the first one, that's what makes it so significant, because it was, the, it was basically the key. What you're looking at here is the key to understanding the language of ancient Egypt, which is something remarkable, because if you can understand the language of a people, you can understand their culture. You can understand what's important to them. You can understand what's not important to them. You can understand where their emphasis lies and the things they just don't know about. So language is absolutely key to understanding a culture of a people. And therefore, this Rosetta Stone is really the first, uh, the first le level of understanding, if you like. Um, and you can look around and the, um, they do have, so they have interest. I don't know if we can zoom in further. Mm. Sorry, we missed it. Okay, but they do have instructions on how to, um, how to read hieroglyphics, except that we can't really get that close. This site, this one here, yeah. We'll give you some examples. Here we go. The key to Egyptian hieroglyphics, you're really going to have to zoom. I can't go for I can't zoom in further, but it does tell you basics and how to uh, how to read hieroglyphics. Okay, so that is but that is the Rosetta Stone. Now, as we walk, we walk through, you can see things are very Egyptian. We have statues of pharaohs, <coughs> often adorned with the snake. Ishaya Hanavi refers to Pharaoh as Atanin Hagadal, the great snake. And this, I think, is perhaps one of the most impressive, oops, sorry, the most impressive statues in the, in the British Museum. We just have to get around it to be able to see it. There we go. And we can stand at the very feet of King Ramesses II. Okay, now, was Ramesses II the paro of Tana, of, of, of what's it called, of, uh, of, of, of Mitzrayim? Where well, was the paro of Mitzrayim? Was he the paro of the time of Moshe Rabbeinu? Was he not? You know, these are questions that academics can debate forever and a day. Would paro have looked something like this? Absolutely. Therefore, can we say with academic certainty that this is who we're looking at? You know, the one where Moshe Rabbeinu comes and says, Shlach Esami. As I you know, it would be a ludicrous thing to say with certainty. However, we're clearly looking at the period of time that the Torah is talking about. Interestingly enough, the pharaohs used to wear fake beards. There's lots to say about that as well. When Yosef Atadik gets taken out of the pit, out of the prison, and gets taken to Paro, he has to shave his beard. The idea of being clean shaven in Egypt was very important, as it is in other cultures as well, connoting innocence, baby-like, childishness, purity, Etc. But with the beard, the fake beard, to add on that uh, that sense of seniority. Just interestingly enough, if Joseph, if Joseph is shaved when he came to Paro, then presumably he remained shaven while he was in Paro's um, court, right? Just suggesting. And if that's true, Rashi tells us the brothers didn't recognize him because he had a beard. Maybe it was one of those beards. Who knows? Just saying. 
Okay. So anyway, who is this? This is Ramses II. What does Ramesses mean? Ramesses is the one born of Ra. Ra was the sun god, a very dominant force in Egypt. He's also called Ramesses the Great. He's the 13th, he's the third pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. He's often, I mean, he's probably the most successful of all pharaohs, and they, they call him, his, his descendants call him the great ancestor, the Alta Zeda, I guess. Um, he was also, the Greeks also called him the one of the chosen of Ra, Maat, Ra, etc. Um, why is, so what, why is this so important? I think that, you know, when we are, when we're talking about Mitzrayim, we have to understand the power of Paro. The power of Paro, Rav explains, is really summed up in the idea of Makas Pachoros. The final thing that really sets the Jewish people free is this Makas Pachoros' death of the firstborn son. Why that? Of all the things, you know, so most of them weren't, weren't firstborns, they could have survived. Why was that the thing that brought Egypt to its knees? And I think what's significant about it is that the firstborns were also gods in Egypt. Everyone was a god. Paro says, I'm a god, I created myself, I created the Nile, I created the world, but every... the firstborns were gods too. Soloveitchik explains, the idea of the firstborn being a god means might makes right. That was the culture of Egypt. Because I came first, I'm therefore stronger, I'm therefore more powerful, therefore I can dominate you. That was what the Jewish people were fighting against. We're called Bani B'chayri Yisrael, we're called God's firstborn. Not because we're stronger, not because we're greater. The Jewish people never, ever prided themselves on physical prowess or strength. That was never part of our DNA. The, greatest, the, the greatness of the Jewish people is the spirit. So then why is it that the firstborn gets double? Why is it the way called the first? The idea of being a firstborn, Rashi explains, Shamroa Evan Yisrael, that Yosef is called an Evan Yisrael, stone of Israel. What does that mean? Evan, says Rashi, Av Uben. Crunch the words together. Av Ben is an Evan. That's one of the reasons why you put a stone on a grave, by the way. Av Ben. Evan. Av Ben Neched, actually. Father, son, grandson is a stone. What does it mean, Evan Yisrael? Av Uben. The Bachar, the firstborn, is the one that is closest to the previous generation but lives in the next generation. Is able to transmit the messages of the previous generation and the languages of the new of the new generation. The reason why the Bahar, the firstborn in Torah, gets more privileges is because he has more responsibility. That's the essence of the Jewish people's chosenness, chosen for responsibility. And therefore, when we are formed in Mitzrayim, the context of that formation of the Jewish people in that iron furnace of Mitzrayim was to stand in contradistinction to power. We're the first ones that are willing to stand up to a culture that says might makes right. If you're older, if you're stronger, you're more powerful, you have the right to dominate and to help with everybody else. Excuse the, the Lashon. That's exactly what Mitzrayim represents. It's pure, brute force and strength. Yisrael is greatness of spirit. You look into the eyes of Parah. And by the way, the Gemara tells us, and it's an amazing image, in Mesech HaZavah, the Parah was a midget. It was one amma tall, 50 centimeters high. Moshe Rabbeinu was 10 ammas tall, say Chazal. That means Moshe Rabbeinu was 10 times taller than Parah. So imagine the image. Let my people go. No, no, no. Like, it's, it, it, Chazal aren't saying, they're talking about it literally. They're talking about who they really were. They might have projected Paro, you look at him, he's projecting an image of strength. But he's really weak. Moshe Rabbeinu was 80 years old when he went to ask, ask Paro to let the Jewish people go. He's not projecting, he can't speak. He's got a stutter. He's not projecting an image of strength. He's projecting an image of weakness, but he's really strong. Because he has greatness of spirit. So I think when we look at, when we look, at, look Paro in the eye, and I've taken my kids here on, uh, uh, when they were much younger, I used to, took them here on Cholomoyed, uh, and we sang Vihisha Amda. We sang Vihisha Amda next to Para. And it's, it's, it's a very, very powerful experience. You look them in the eye, and you say, Para, yeah, look at you. You're an oversized bust. And here we are every single year, 
commemorating your downfall. Machas Bacharas, where you couldn't take it anymore because the idea of might makes right was absolutely destroyed. But there's something else as well. Let's, let's take a little walk behind him. Let's take a little walk behind him. Interesting, this little bowl here, by the way, just uh, it's for libations, for, uh, for liquid offerings to idols. Okay, this is a libation bowl here. But look at this. This is what well, I think my favorite, one of my favorite artifacts in the museum. Let's see if I can stand with this X marks the spot. It'll probably give us a better view. Apologies. Oh, there we go. So if you're getting dizzy or seasick. Sorry. That will have to do. Look in the air, straight on. And this, this is so powerful. This is just so incredible. Okay. This is a granite statue of Amun. Okay. Amun is, a, is, a, is an idol, a, a force, if you like, in the force of a ram. And he's protecting a paro. This isn't our paro necessarily. So it's King uh, Taharka. And this, this, this statue here, there's a, there's a few of these that are knocking around. But this is so powerful because what you have. Um, in the, they found it in a temple, a place called uh, Kawa in Nubia. And this is slightly later. This, this comes from already a period about 500 years after Yitzhak Mitzrayim. But what's significant to us when we talk about Pesach is that the ram is one of the animals that was holy to Amun. And there are several temples dedicated to it. Um, and many of them will include within them ram's headed sphinxes as well. Why is that so important? Because it's Pesach. Korban Pesach. Every family. You can look at my, uh, my WhatsApp status if you want. On the 10th of Nisan today, so we have tied a sheep to the bed. Don't worry, it's not alive. Um, but we have tied a sheep to the bed um, to start the Pesach preparations uh, in, our, in our house. Um, and that sheep will probably make its way down to the Seder at some point um, at the end of the week. Why is the sheep so important? Mitzrayim worship the sheep. It's holy, it's sacred. They can't even deal with the fact that the Bnei Yaakov, the Yosef's brothers, are shepherds. Kitavas Mitzrayim Koroet. So, why? The sheep gives you meat, it gives you milk, it gives you clothes. It gives you everything a human being could possibly need. And therefore, it's worthy of worship. It's worshiping the physical world. It's worshiping physicality for physicality's sake. The Jewish people are totally immersed in this culture of Mitzrayim. We're a bunch of idol worshippers as well. To the point where we stand at the Yamsuf, the angels in Shamayim say, Hashem, why are you saving the Jews over the Egyptians? What for? These ones worship idols and these ones worship idols. There's no material difference between the two. That's how bad things were. Our exit ticket from Mitzrayim was twofold. Number one, to slaughter the sheep, and number two, to do bris milah, really the other way around. Number one, to do bris milah, and once you've done bris milah, you can slaughter the sheep. Two bloods. We say on Satan, I say to you through your blood, you will live, and I say to you through your blood, you will live. Two bloods. What two bloods will you live? The blood of bris milah and the blood of Korban Pesach. We need both of them in order to be able to walk out of Mitzrayim. What does that mean? <coughs> the blood of Bris Mila is the blood of Kedusha. It's the blood of holiness, of being able to control our sensual urges. That's the blood of Kedusha. Karban Pesach is the blood of Emunah, of faith in Hashem, of realizing that nothing in the physical world no sheep, no donkey, no cow, no natural forces, the sun, the moon, and the stars have any power whatsoever in the face of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And that's, that's really what the 10 Makos are doing. They're showing Hashem's mastery. That you should know that there's none like me in the entire world. 
That's what's going on throughout the template showing Hashem's mastery over creation. But the climax of it all on that first Seder night in Egypt, 3,333 years ago, tonight, they would have taken one of those sheep and tied it up to the bed and inspected it daily for four days, making sure that it was perfect. And when the time came, Shabbos Agadl, they slaughtered it in front of the eyes of the Egyptians. They didn't say anything. It's roasted. The smell of burnt God wafts throughout Egypt. They eat it whole. Don't bake any bones. Behave like nobility. Let it be very clear what you're doing. We sprinkle the blood on the doorposts. Interestingly enough, by the way, it was on the inside of the doorpost, not the outside of the doorpost. It was for us. Hashem doesn't need to see. He knows what's going on inside. Why on the sides and why on the front? Because doorpost actually provides us with two different things. Sorry, a house provides us with two different things. It provides us with protection from the elements. Can't rain. If it rains inside your house, it's pretty useless. You need a roof over your head. That's the blood on the lintel. But it also provides us some protection from people we don't want to come into our houses. We're safe. Front door. That's the blood on the doorpost. Two aspects of a house. And the Jewish people were being formed at that point into the family unit. Suddenly we start to form our family units, which have been the strength of Kali throughout the generations. And formed in Mitzrayim at that point. But not just family units, social units. If your family is too small, or if you've got too much, share. Don't save. Share what you have with others. Benevolence, generosity. <coughs> it's all there at this formation point, at this birth point of the nation. But in order to go free physically, first we have to go free, free spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. We have to be able to slaughter the gods of Mitzrayim. Which is why the word Mitzrayim is related etymologically, say the Chassidish Shasfarim, to Mitzarim. Mitzarim is in the, in the depths, in the straits. I can't. It's where they're determining who you are. Your slave master's telling you who you are. Nah. No way. Mitzarim. Yitzias Mitzrayim. Means getting the Egypt out of you. The exodus from Egypt means Yitziami Mitzrayim. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim is getting the Egypt out of you. The way we do it is through the image that you see in front of you. It's by slaughtering this sheep and being able to walk free. I must tell you something else. You can walk around. These are different uh, places, funeral uh, coffins and places where bones will be placed. Um, British Museum is no place for Kernan, by the way. So, uh, you know, this is your chance to see it because the chances of you going in are slim. There's bones everywhere. So get as close as you can now. Okay, and they have, for example, just so you can see in the corner here, whoop, see, there you go. There you have a uh, good old fashioned Egyptian fertility goddess. These are idols that would have been worshipped uh, in Egypt, two of those flanking the, uh, the stairways over there as well. Now, there are there is a huge amount to see here. We'll just uh, share a few more things the, in the time that we have. One minute. Because no trip. Yeah, no trip, no trip to Egypt is really uh, is really complete without going to visit the mummies. Um, mummification was obviously a major, major part of Egyptian. One second, one here, the other side. Okay, mummification was a major, major part of Egyptian culture. You can see them there, ornate. These obviously was only the uh, the richest of the rich that could afford a levaya and a kavura like this. But the idea is they're trying to preserve, you know, with the Yaakov Avini, the Echantu, so they, uh, they preserved him, they embalmed him. They're trying to preserve the physicality of the body. They're burying people with their treasures. All the great funeral rites, you know, that's why all the grave robbers are coming in afterwards. You get buried with your treasures. They think you can take it with you. You know, it couldn't be further from the truth and further from what we stand for as a nation. The fact that you can't take anything with you when you go into the next world, the only thing you can take with you is your Torah and your mitzvahs and your good deeds. You look around, and they've done, if you can see, let's see if we can see any. 
They've done CT scans. If you can see it here. They've done CT scans on some of the people that are inside here. And you can see some of the results of the scans on the, um, on the walls next to them as well. Various forms of reconstruction. One second, my favorite one is actually, if you can see it, we've got a mummified cat, which is kind of cute. Um, that's on the wall somewhere as well. I can't really get close enough to see it. So certainly going to visit the mummies, this is a, a beautiful and incredible collection. Again, puts you in that world of Egypt and uh, just helps us to understand where we are. There are two other things I'd like to share with you. Um, and that is because however great the British Museum is, it's like an iceberg. All the really good, all the major stuff is actually underground. All the really important stuff is actually in the archives. Right, it's catalogued, it's where the academic research is taking place, it's where the real, uh, where the real stuff's going on, not the stuff that's on show to the plebs like us. But if you really want to go on a, on a fancy tour, you want to be able to go and see stuff in the, um, in the archives. So what I once had the privilege of going into the archives with Rabbi Arya Forta, who um, organized a session with the chief Egyptologist of the museum. It was absolutely fascinating. I just want to share with you a couple of the things that they have there that you would not be able to see on a normal trip. Just one second. Yeah, look at... One minute. Let's see if we can see here. Here we go. Okay. If you look here, this is a mud brick. This is not actually from the British Museum, but they do have them in the British Museum itself. We know that when the Bnei Yisrael complain, or Moshe Rabbeinu complains to, the, to, to Paro in his first failed attempt, Paro says, these Jews have obviously got too much time on their hand that they're contemplating freedom. Make them work much harder. Don't give them any straw. In fact, if you look at this note here, many ancient constructions of probably you unfired mud brick as a primary building material, famous biblical story of Exodus and save Israelites forced to make mud bricks for the Egyptians. A task made even more arduous with Pharaoh, Pharaoh rescinded their supplied straw source, straw source, gather their own or make it without. They have a brick in the British Museum full of straw, exactly as the Torah describes. And it's just remarkable. Little details that show the Torah was written exactly when it came to the written. And if someone later on in life, later on in world history, would have been writing the story anachronistically, right, why would they have put the straw in the bricks? Clearly, whoever wrote it was around at the time. And the, just, just it's an ama amazing thing to see. The, the, the brick they have, just again, full disclosure, the brick they have in the British Museum was not from the same area where the Jews were enslaved, but it was from the same time. So it is contemporary, but would not have been made by our ancestors. It was made far further south towards Ethiopia. But what is also very interesting, by the way, is we Ashkenazim have the minhag of Charoses with apples and nuts and wine and cinnamon. And every single element of them has a different, um, has different symbolism. But the Charoses is a memory of the cement. So we put in the cinnamon sticks or whatever stringy things, apple, grated apple, commemoration of the straw. If you are Sfadi, you might have a very different way of making charoses. Some of my Sfadi friends, say some of my best friends are Sfadi, some of my Sfadi friends um, have a very different type of charoses. What do they do? They take dates and they boil them up. And when they finish boiling the dates, they boil them again. And when they finish boiling it again, I think they boil it again and again. Until once you've boiled dates, you know, boil them and boil them, boil them, they don't look like very much like dates anymore. But what they do look like is a very sweet, thick gray paste, exactly like the bricks that you can see. So there are different aspects of the bricks and mortar that we bring to our Seder table. The Ashkenazim, we're focusing a little bit more on the straw aspect of it with our grated cinnamon or apples. <coughs> but if you're Sfadi, you're going to be focusing on much more what a mud brick would have looked like with your mud like chlorosis. And it's just amazing how all the different elements of this interactive Seder experience that we have, the edible Seder experience that we have. There's one final thing that I'd like to share, just because I think it's just truly remarkable as well, is this one here. Um, and this is just an example of one of the things they've got in the archives. And this is a handheld copper mirror. Why is a handheld copper mirror um, significant to us? Because in the end of Sefer Shemois and Parashas Pukudei, 
Moshe Rabbeinu takes the Maros Hatsovos. He takes the women's handheld copper mirrors and builds a kiar out of them. And he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't think it's appropriate. A mirror is an object of vanity, of self-adornment, of beauty. The Jewish women would beautify themselves to their husbands. Moshe Rabbeinu thought it wasn't appropriate. Hashem says, no, 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 no. It's these copper mirrors where the Jewish women have beautified themselves to their husbands that actually ensured the continuity of the Jewish people. I want you to make the kiar out of that. And these are handheld copper mirrors, exactly as the Torah describes. These are just snippets where you immerse yourself in the world of Mitzrayim to remind ourselves that this, this place was real. It's not the stuff of storybooks and, hist- and, uh, and comic books, but rather Mitzrayim was a real culture. This is the context within which the Jewish people were born. It was a culture that was really the opposite of who we were meant to become. Right? It was the school of hard knocks. That's the Kor Habarza. It was, a, it was an environment that totally redefined our relationship with the physical world. It totally determined who we were gonna be as a nation if only we could get out. And that's really the significance of looking at these things um, just before, it's literally just a few days before Satan night to be able to immerse ourselves in it and to be able to say, um, we'll leave it there in terms of the, uh, in terms of things that we're going to see. I promise you there is so much more to see. And I would far rather be there doing it than uh, than doing this on a Zoom. There, there are just it's just it is over over a bit overwhelming. I'll tell you one thing they've got there, for example. I'm not going to show you a picture now, I'll save it for when we go. Probably the only chance you will ever get to see of a picture of a Jewish king. There is a picture of Yehu Melech Yisrael. That is a Jewish king from the time of the first temple, bowing down to Shalmanessa, offering a tribute. It's on a black obelisk. You can see it. Uh, it's clearly mentioned on the side, on the, uh, on the writing, Yehu Melech Israel. You see a Jewish king from the kingdom of Israel bowing down. It's just, it's, it's, it's basic, but it's incredible. You can get to see a machatzis hashakal that they found on Har Habayis, that a, a Jew had given in the year 68 or 69, just before the temple was destroyed, had taken their half shekel to Yushalayim. It's found its way to a wall in the coin collection of the British Museum. It's just these things, you can walk straight past them but there's so much part of our culture, of our history, and it really does bring it alive. So uh, we'll stop it there, but if you've got any questions, really feel free.